It's 7.36 on LBC. Uh, Kemi Badenoch joins us, the Conservative MP for Saffron Walden, my hometown, so I know, know it well. Um, uh, and it's great to see you here. You've made a real impact on this uh, contest. It, were you expecting to get the levels of support that you've had so far when, when you signed up for it? To be honest, I don't know what I was expecting. Um, it was a bit of a, an instant sort of spontaneous decision with... Uh, some of my MP colleagues, the ones who resigned with me uh, this time last week. But and, why you and not them? Um, they said they thought I could do it. And I thought, mm, might, this might be something that, that I might think about doing sometime in the in the future. But because I'd always uh, been discussing with them about what the party was getting wrong. And as ministers, we don't say what we think. We have to take collective responsibility and hold the party line. But behind closed doors, you know, we talk about the things that we disagree with. And we were all of the same mind. Uh, but they felt that I could make the best case for what we felt was going wrong in the country. Oh, that's very flattering of them to, to, it was, to say that. It was that. very flattering. But, and, um, and they did twist my arm. <laughs> but I mean, I'm glad they did. Most people, even politicians, have a bit of imposter syndrome. Mm. Do you not suffer from that at all, or are you um, incredibly self-confident? I think, I think we all do, but I just think it's more important to do the right thing and say what needs to be said. And after the resignation, it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders, and we all thought, well, what do we do now? <laughs> and the uh, compulsion to do something, uh, given the melee that we're all in, uh, is what spurred me on. So it's been six days six, seven days, and um, it's been amazing. And the support we've we found in the party has also been amazing. And you're a good fourth place. I mean, you're not that far behind Liz Truss, which no. is a place that you probably didn't think that you would be in by no. now. <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased, but I am in it to win it. And what has given me confidence is that I've beaten, I think, five secretaries of state or former secretaries of state, and also today the Attorney General. So that shows that I can hold my own with all of the people who've been in, in Cabinet. And in fact, people are asking, well, why... I think Seb Payne has an article in the FT about why some of people have not been put in Cabinet when clearly there was so much talent on the back benches. And that, I think, is incredibly flattering to hear. Uh, has that been a matter of frustration for you over the past couple no. of years? I mean, you've, you've had various ministerial jobs. Mm. Um, I know that so you have been a little bit frustrated at, at times uh, with, with the sort of strictures of what yes. ministerial responsibility yes. imposes on you. Yes. Um, and... I'm sure you will find other ministers who will complain that I often stray outside my brief, but I just can't help it if I think that something isn't quite right. So something like the online safety bill, I had written letters to DCMS saying what we're doing is not correct, look at what these people are talking about, the Section 10 isn't quite right around the, the legal but harmful. I like most of the, the bill is, is good. It started off as the online harms bill, looking at terrorism, you know, uh, abuse of children, but it's expanded. It's become a Christmas tree bill with lots of other things put in it. And I do understand the issue it's trying to address, but I think the way it's worded, it'll end up going after people who aren't doing anything wrong and puts power in the hands of politicians, which what, I don't think is correct. How does it go after people who you say aren't doing anything wrong? <clears throat> because uh, it defines legal but harmful in a way that is based on the perception of someone who feels that harm has been done to them, rather the intention or, rather, or, or whether actual harm has taken place. So, for example, if someone says, and this is, the, this is one of the most frequent examples, if someone says, I don't think trans women are women, you can say that that has caused severe distress and that's harmful, but that's someone's personal opinion. That, that wouldn't be covered in this. That's not true. Why would you think so? Well, because if you look at the way that the, well, it depends. I suppose it depends which which section we're looking at. Mm. But um, I mean, for example, um, section nineteen, subsection two of this mm. bill, uh, so you say it puts a great, it does it puts too many protections on, uh, or doesn't put enough protections on freedom of speech. Now, the advocates of the legislation would say mm. it actually enhances freedom of speech. I disagree with them. We can go. We can go back and forth on it. There are other areas uh, which they. I don't. I can't remember exactly which sections. They are in my um, in my notes. But this is something that we've been having lots of arguments about. And just uh, day before yesterday, David Wilson QC, the former Advocate General, 
agreed with me and said that I was correct and the Secretary of State was wrong. So when you have... And Nadine bill, Doris has had a bit of a go at you today. She, she, she has. And, you know, she's entitled to to say what she feels. I'm not going to be having spats on Twitter. That's not me. Uh, she, she likes doing that. I have a view and I said that I won't be supporting the bill in its current form. Not that I don't like all that's in the bill. But I think it's important that those of us who are backbenchers get a chance to say what we think is wrong. And given that there is a uh, caretaker government, this is not the time to be but, putting... But do you think that the sections on children's protection, on pornography, for example, or Absolutely. self-harm... Those are fine. Yeah, those are fine. You're, you're, yeah, you're yeah, okay yes, with yes, those? Yes, yes, it's the, so, it's the so it's actually from, specific It's a specific bit. bit. And right. one of the hardest things uh, about being a politician is people often assume you're saying more than what you're saying. What I said was I won't support the bill in its current form. People have heard she won't support the bill, which is a completely different thing. Mm. So it's it's nice to be able to make that nuance clear. You are accused of being a culture warrior. <coughs> um, yes. Which, given that you've been <laughs> equalities minister mm. for the, well, I don't know how long for, but certainly for the last year or so, um, is quite something. And people are, I mean, we had Dane Baptiste, the comedian, was on the programme mm. last night. And he accused you of trying to make critical race theory illegal. Mm. Um, he called you a, pub, a marionette of the establishment, mm. which I took him to task on. because <laughs> Because, well, it seemed to me that he was basically <coughs> saying that you were willingly, as a black female conservative politician, mm. you were willingly being used by the white establishment politician. And, uh, of course, he's completely wrong. I am my own woman, uh, I have my own mind. Uh, what I said, again, this is another example of people who they can't really understand nuance. They're so obsessed with polarizing debates that they're not listening to what people are saying. What I said in that debate in, I think it was 2020, was schools should not teach critical race theory as fact because it's disputed. And that's what we do for a whole range of things. But all people heard was the first bit of that sentence, don't treat, uh, don't teach critical race theory. The truth is, they don't actually teach critical race theory that much. The theory, the theory as it is in, in academia, they practice it, which is something completely different. And one of the challenges that um, we have today is that the, uh, I, I don't know whether it's the cultural establishment or, or whoever, seem to think that there is only one way to be black and anyone who is not like that is not really black, which of course means nothing to me. I grew up in Nigeria, it's a country of 200 million people. It's a great country, has lots of difficulty. I speak another language, uh, I speak it as a first language in fact. Uh, English is my second language, not many people know that. I don't need people whose only experience of being black is being an ethnic minority in the UK but, to tell me what that means. Because effectively, what he was saying, even if he didn't know it, <coughs> was that you can't be black and be a Tory. Yes, um, which is, of course, nonsense. You can be black and be a Tory and be successful. And we see variations of this argument in schools. Uh, well, you're, you're quite swatty. That's not really the black thing to do, and so on. And it is, in, in, it is its own form of racism. But w one thing that I try to make clear is that if you are a black person who challenges this orthodoxy, you get shut down. And I use someone like Tony Sewell as an example. So even though I, I, I believe that we are uh, probably the majority um, who have this view, most people don't want to say anything because the cost is too high. Tony Sewell had an honorary degree removed from Nottingham University, withdrawn rather, because he said the issues in this country are less to do with race, but more to do with deprivation. And that drove people mad, they misrepresented him, that's wrong. And I feel that it is my duty, not just as a minister, but also as an MP, someone who has a voice, who can't be easily shut down or cancelled, to speak up for those people. And the difference between someone like me and the Dane, Dane Baptiste, Dane Baptiste. is that I am willing to, to accept that he has a different view. He does not believe that I should have my view or I should exist. That is a real problem. These are people who want to cancel and want to shut out other people who have a different opinion, and I won't stand but for that. You are somebody who I think is seen as a bit of a divider rather than a conciliator, though, aren't you? And <coughs> given what the country's been through over the last six years, I wonder, wonder whether that is a, is a good trait for a new prime minister. Um, I think it's a shame that people think that because that's not actually what I've been saying. What I do say is that we should not divide ourselves. We should not focus on the things that make us different, but focus on the things that make us the same. I tell people that I don't see skin colour, I see individuals. I think looking at skin colour all the time is divisive. So how can my saying that be divisive? 
It's it's completely wrong-headed. Mm. It's very topsy-turvy. But people never believe that, do they? Because I, I, I've said that on the programme yes. in the yes. past. So, people, so, how could you possibly understand exactly. as a white man? They, they are wrong. They are wrong. They don't believe that because that's how they think. And they think that way, so they assume everybody else thinks mm. that way. That's not true. People are different. There are some people who see skin colour. There are some people who don't notice it. And we should be able to accept that rather than saying that the people who don't notice it are liars. What about experience? Because, yes, you have been a minister in, is it three different departments? Yes. Um, but not at cabinet level. Mm -hmm. um, the, the phrase, no time for a novice, has been bandied about a bit in, in, in this context. Mm -hmm. But do you see yourself as a change candidate, somebody yeah. who's going to bring in a completely different way of governing? Absolutely. And, I mean, you've made some proposals. I was reading something, was it today or yesterday, about you want to split up the Treasury and reduce the power of the Treasury, to which I thought, good luck with that. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it wouldn't be quite a split, but taking the responsibility for economic growth and having someone else mark the homework there, I think, is quite important. And I say that because I was the minister responsible for economic growth. I was the mm. Treasury Minister, the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. And when you've done a job, you should have ideas about how the job can change and be improved. And you rarely hear anyone saying, well, this is actually how... But would you, would you know how to drive that through? Yes. I, I suppose what and I'm saying is, if you're a Prime Minister... I kind of touched yes. on this with Tom Tugendhat, who's yes. got no ministerial experience. Mm. How do you know how to pull the levers of power and turn the oil tank around? <laughs> By having good people. So it's not. So, so one of the problems that we have in this country is that we started moving towards a presidential system, assuming that the personality of the prime minister has to do everything. That is not the case. A prime minister should have a cabinet, and everyone in cabinet should be there on merit and be competent, not because they supported the leadership bid or because they're mates or, or whatever. When you have that, you will get a government that works better. Someone like Theodore Agnew, for example, who resigned recently, um, and I, I, I was in the Treasury with him as a Treasury Minister. He's brilliant, and he was pointing out things that were wrong in the Treasury, and no one was listening and he and I would have conversations, we would talk to officials, but officials don't respond to junior ministers in the same way that they respond to the cabinet, um, uh, the cabinet mm. minister. And that is the sort of person who, he's backing me, he's supporting my campaign, and he's brilliant. He would be able to do that sort of job. He has the experience. I also have Michael Gove. He is the longest serving and the most experienced cabinet minister backing me. Of course, he would be in any cabinet that I had, but it's about people. It's not just about me. What I would be providing is the leadership and the direction. We need to change. We can't keep doing things the way we've been doing over the last five or so years. Have you told Michael Gove or have you negotiated with Michael Gove what job that would be? Nope. No, I have not. Although um, he is somebody who I think he could do anything uh, and everything brilliantly. But he's, he's always wanted my... to be chancellor, hasn't he? I don't know. I don't know if he has always wanted you to be chancellor. Do. I know yes, he wanted do. to do. I know he wanted to do education, which is where when when we became friends. But um, he is a friend of mine, and I'm uh, very happy that he's. Um, the education. Times is saying that Suella Braverman, who dropped out today or was eliminated, will back Liz Truss for the Tory leadership. Um, are you disappointed that you haven't got her support? I am disappointed. Uh, Suella and I are friends. Um, friends with Tom Tugendhat as well. Rishi and Liz were my senior ministers, so it's all very close to home. We're all friends. We're you know, we're, we're part of the Conservative family. So every Every time someone supports one person, there's another person that's been that's been let down. But I am in it to win it. I think I have something different to say. And I know that people want to support the person who they think is most likely to give them a job or who has just been there longest. That's the easy thing to do. The tough thing to do is to take a risk and try something different. And that's what I'm asking okay. my colleagues to do. Right, time to take some questions. Uh, 0345 6060 973. <coughs> it's 10 to 8. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Stuart now Lord Rose, Conservative here, phenomenally successful businessman. Who do you think would attract the business vote of these super six still in contention? I back Rishi. He is competent. He has been around in government. He does have a big brain. He does understand the need for us to get our economy back on track. Years of inactivity by a Conservative government. Did you ever consider leaving the Conservative benches, Stuart? Well, I have to tell you, I've looked at myself in the mirror from time to time and asked myself, can I support what is going on? I'm not very comfortable with the right-wing turn of this government. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. 
Femi Bazenok is with me. She is in fourth place at the moment, I think I'm right in saying, in, in the league table of the Conservative Leadership contestants. has got 49 votes today, nine more than uh, in the first round. And um, a lot of people are saying, well, she is the one to watch. She said twice on this programme so far, I'm in it to win it. Well, let's test that out with some calls. Let's go to Delroy, who's in Brixton. Hello, Delroy. Hello, Ian. Thank you very much for having me on. And God bless you, Kimmy. I hope you win. I think you're the best candidate, whether or not a vet, sir, but it's in God's hands. But I just wanted to ask you a question. I am disabled. And as an equalities minister, Kimmy, if you work to, to, to get the top job or even close to the top, can you make any undertakings, please, for those of us out here who are on fixed income disability benefits, who got 3.1%, mm. as you know, in the previous April annual increase, it's nowhere near the prevailing rate of inflation. Is there any way that you can yeah. make some undertaking that we can look forward to a better future, given that we will be having fuel price rises? And uh, it, it's just, we've got nowhere to tell. We can't go and get another job like a lot of people who are able-bodied can. So can I ask you that? Yes, yes, you can. First of all, thank you for your very kind comments. Uh, and secondly, you are absolutely right. Uh, people like you who are on fixed incomes are most at risk uh, from the 9.1% inflation which we have. And it is a point which I have made multiple times that even though I am somebody who believes in cutting tax and making sure that uh, we reduce spending in those areas where we shouldn't, people like you who are on um, universal credit or on uh, disability benefits do need uh, a top up to keep up with inflation. And that's something that I would certainly be looking to do. I think you're right. And um, I think during the immediate issue we need to resolve is this cost of living crisis. And I would do everything we could um, to help you. OK, Delroy, thank you. Chris is in Richmond. Hi, Chris. Good evening, Cammy. Good evening, Ian. Um, uh, Cammy, you Hi. talked about in a speech about re reducing or removing superfluous <laughs> support staff and peripheral activities in schools. I've got two children, mm. one of whom has special needs, another one has dyscalculia. Which support mm. are you going to take away from my children and other people in the borough of Richmond? Well, we, already have, we already have a massive deficit neither, in terms of Neither of them. Needs. I think, um, I, think uh, I, I don't think, and I will apologise, I don't think I expressed what I was saying as clearly as I, as I possibly could have. The, the point I was making was that government does too much. And I think that teachers also do too much. When I speak to the teachers in my schools, uh, in, in my constituency, I'm overwhelmed by what they have to deal with. And I think that if they didn't have to deal with so much, they wouldn't need all the support staff um, that they've got at the moment. That was the point I was trying to make. But I think it sounded to many people like I was saying, uh, we need to get rid of support staff. That would be crazy. Uh, I see the SEND needs. We have SEND um, needs are increasing exponentially. That's not absolutely not something that I would be looking to cut. But it was more about the burdens that we're placing on teachers and on schools. It's um, I speak to uh, so many people who work in the education sector, and I am concerned about the workload and the worries that they have. Chris, are you reassured? Not at all. Like, I mean, that's, what does she mean by the word superfluous? I mean, my, my school teachers are working extreme. I have worked extremely hard during COVID. There's a mental health crisis in schools. You know, they can't. You know, they can't keep teachers, particularly young ones, because they're not paid enough. What on earth is the word superfluous? Can you name me a single job in a school that needs to be cut? An example of a post that you would cut tomorrow if you were made Prime Minister, so, Kenny. So I think again, again the, point, the point I'm making is that we are giving teachers too much to do, and that's why they need the support staff. If we didn't do that, then they wouldn't need so much support. That's what I mean. It's about, it's about the burdens that we're placing on um, public sector workers like teachers. Chris, thank you very much. Let's go to Clifford, who's in Lewisham. Clifford, what's your question, please? My question is, as a person who, who comes from an Afro-Caribbean background and remembers the, the, the debacle of when John Taylor wanted to become a, the very first black conservative MP... You're going oh, back a bit now. Yes, that's how old I am, and I, and I was following... 30 years politics. ago. <laughs> yeah, and I was following politics then, and seeing how how the Tories have treated black people over the years, especially, and, and now that the only reason I believe that the Tories are accepting people of colour is because of the law that if you didn't, then you couldn't, you couldn't stand for wow. Parliament. What makes... There's, there's no such law, I'm afraid. <laughs> there's no such law. What I would say, um, what I would say to you um, is it wasn't the Tory party that rejected John Taylor, it was the voters. 
And that 92 election, quite a lot of people lost their seats. Quite a lot of Conservatives lost, lost their seats. Labour made many gains and many candidates didn't win. I don't think... Um, uh, I don't think he was treated particularly well, but the voters had the say. Sorry, I think he lost. He lost to a Liberal Democrat. Lost, lost to a Liberal Democrat, and we didn't win that seat back with white candidates in, until 2010. So I think there's there's a lot more nuance that, I mean, than that. How have you and found I, it? You, you, no, you, but, but you, let, me, let me just finish it, Ian. I think given the level of diversity that we have in the party, it is crazy to say uh, that things uh, that uh, you know conservatives don't treat people of colour well. That's absolutely not true. There's so much that we have done. And we have uh, a programme called Inclusive Britain. It's our strategy for inclusivity and reducing ethnic and racial disparities. I think people need to look at what government actually is doing and not look at what happened 30 years ago in one particular constituency and paint us all like that. When you were selected for Saffron Walden, mm -hmm. a very white area, yep. um, not many people would have expected a black woman to be elected, uh, selected in, in a seat like Saffron Walden, but mm -hmm. Pretty Patel was selected in Whitham, James mm -hmm. Cleverly in Braintree, That's right. uh, Adam Afrie in Windsor, mm -hmm. I could go on. But have you encountered any of the prejudice that Clifford clearly thinks exists in the Conservative no, Party? No, The prejudice that I encounter is always from the left. So when I when I got selected in Saffron Walden, and, and, I, and, and these are the sorts of people that I tell you don't see skin colour, they're listening to what you're saying. And that's what's amazing about our country. I came to this country age 16, and I'm standing to be Prime Minister. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I was born here, but I didn't grow up here. That is amazing. And I don't understand why people want to look, um, ignore all of the good things and only focus on the bad things and use the bad things to tell the story. We should look at everything in the round. And um, I'm just very proud of my party and the way that we are representative of this country. Uh, Mukhtar says, Ian, this lady is a breath of fresh air, answering questions like a human, not an MP, and I tend to lean towards Labour. Please ask her what she thinks of Rwanda Gate, he calls it. Okay. Um... It's been very interesting uh, watching the reaction to the policy on Rwanda. I, I, I'll start off by saying that I support it because Rwanda is not the country that it was 30 years ago. It is actually a place people go to on holiday. And but we, I've been we really accept refugees from Rwanda because of human rights abuses, though, don't we? Um, that might be the case. It is the case. Yes, that might be the case, but that doesn't mean that the people who um, we would be sending there for asylum would be, would be undergoing that. We do that for loads of other countries who also accept asylum seekers. So we need, to be, we need to be a little bit more balanced on that. But what's amazed me is the way that people have talked about Rwanda, I would say, trashed the country. Um, that's been actually very insulting for people of sub-Saharan origin. I know that it is a tricky policy. It's something we've never done before. But people are dying trying to come to our country. They are dying, they are being trafficked, and the only people profiting are people smugglers. It is not legal immigration. It makes it harder for people to come to our country legally. And we need a deterrent if people know... It's not a deterrent, is it? I, 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 think, if, I think if we could get past these legal hurdles, I think it could be. We, it, haven't, it, even, we haven't tried the policy no, yet. But it can only be a deterrent if you say, do this and you will be deported to Rwanda. What we're saying at the moment is you've probably got a one in a hundred chance of being deported well, do, to Rwanda. Do, that is not a deterrent. I, I think do it and you may have to go to Rwanda. And I don't like the word deported, even though um, I understand why you use it. Do it and you may is a deterrent. But let's try it. If the policy doesn't work, then we will know we tried it and it didn't work. But at the moment, we are being stopped from carrying out policies which we have uh, made commitments to the public about. And I think that that is wrong. Right, let's go to uh, Sarah in Grimsby. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Ian. Hi, Kemi. I hope you're both uh, well. I was just a uh, simple question, really. Uh, Kemi, what are you going to do for young people? Uh, for young people, I think that there are so many things uh, that... Uh, is creating intergenerational unfairness. I think it's uh, many young people will probably look at my party and think that we only ever do things for, for the elderly. And I really want to turn that around and show that it isn't true. I think for many young people, the issues that concern them are housing, being able to either rent Afford, afford rent or buy their own home. So trying to reduce the cost of housing 
is absolutely critical. I think that requires building more homes. And we've been doing quite a lot of work in the department that I just left around tackling... How many of your constituents in Saffron Walden would like more homes in, in their green leafy countryside? Quite a few. But what they don't want is paving over countryside without infrastructure. They want beautiful homes that are in keeping with the community because their children are also unable to buy um, there. And um, Saffron Walden is a town in, the con in all of the constituency. The constituency is named after it, but it is absolutely huge mm. and there are so many people in other areas like Take Lee for example or even the Chelmsford end of the constituency who do say they would like to see more housing. What I don't want is um, housing targets. Uh, I think that we can do something better in terms of showing how we can build uh, in a way that a community will accept rather than top-down planning. Uh, Sarah thank you. Faz is in Finchley. Hello Faz. Hi Kemi. Um, you're sitting down in front of Vladimir Putin, staring him in the eyes, and you have to tell him that he has to stop what he's doing. Without any experience, how would you possibly uh, deal with Vladimir, not only Vladimir Putin, but the president of China, um, the uh, uh, ruler of Saudi Arabia, and all these people? How would you well, possibly I tell these thugs and rulers what to do? You, you say without experience, but the truth is uh, virtually nobody has experience of doing that. So I don't think that that counts against me. If the question you're asking is how would I engage with uh, senior ministers or uh, heads of state in other countries, that's something that I actually do have experience of. Um, you know, I was at a G20 summit last year. I had very good engagement with people from uh, lots of countries, ministers from lots of countries um, around the world. But when you look at what happened with Emmanuel Macron, he sat in a room with Putin far away at the end of the table. He looked him in, in the eye and, and nothing happened. And the truth is, people will only respect you if you show that you are someone who is serious, someone who is telling the truth and someone who has the resources to um, deal robustly with them. And that's why what is more important is making sure that our country um, spends enough on defence, that we look after our borders and that we um, continue to maintain good relations with our allies. And that's the sort of thing that Vladimir Putin would respect, rather than knowing that I've sat in a room with other leaders before. A few quick fire questions for the end. OK. Yes or no answers. Scrap the BBC licence fee. No. Scrap Channel 4 privatisation. Um, no. So, but, 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 but these are all nuanced positions. There's a charter, there's a charter renewal around the licence fee, so let's see. But I'm not somebody who wants to scrap things just to annoy other people. If the licence fee is not, sorry, I know you said quick fire, ha, ha. <laughs> um, If the licence fee is not working anymore, let's look again. But as of today, no. Okay, well, let's Privatization, talk about, yes. Let's talk about something to unscrap. Okay. Uh, DFID, would you re recreate that as a separate department? Um, no, no, I think that would just be more upheaval. It works well in the FCO, let's just do it better. Your worst mistake? Can't remember. This, is, this has been the one that everyone's had a, a real tricky... Tom Tugendhat literally sat there for about a minute and couldn't think of anything. I, I, you must... There I must do, it's, be something it's, it's, that you can remember. I would need to um, think of something that I really regret and it's sorry, it's not coming to me. OK. Um, <laughs> if, if you drop out, who would you then support? Ah, who have the others said? Has anyone said me? Nobody said anybody. If you say somebody now, you'll be the first to say anybody. Hmm. Well, let's see how we do after the debates and then I'll know. <laughs> see, I think you were just about to say it and then you pulled back. No, no, no. That's not um, That's not quite the case. Different candidates have different merits. And, you know, I, you, you were talking about Suella supporting Liz. I'm not sure that she would have been able to answer that question until just when when she did it. There is all to play for. They are my friends. Um, both Rishi and Liz in particular were my senior ministers. I don't want to make one jealous. So I probably know, but I won't say. OK, it sounds like one of those two anyway. <laughs> um, say something nice about Keir Starmer. Um... He seems like a really nice family man. I think that's quite sweet. Um, your favourite karaoke song of choice? Uh, Final Countdown. We do carpool karaoke with my children when we're driving to and from. So, you see, this, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, I wonder whether David Cameron or David Davis would have had a favourite karaoke song, but you all have so far. And finally, your sporting hero. My sporting hero? Ooh... I'm not, I'm not a big sports person, so let me think. What sporting moment have I uh, really loved? I, I, do you know what? Um, it is, and now I've forgotten her name, uh, Simone Biles. 
Okay. I think she's amazing. Kemi, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for joining us. The very best of luck. Now, in a moment, we're going to get your reaction to these last two interviews with Tom Tuganat and Kerry Badenoch. And we're going to talk more about Liz Truss. We've covered Rishi Sunak and also Penny Mordaunt earlier in the week. So tonight, I want to know whether you think Liz Truss would make a good Prime Minister. If so, why? And if not, why not? Uh, it's five minutes past eight. 